Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for those of you who are returning from yesterday. Welcome to those of you who are just joining the conference today. If you are joining the conference, a few things to note about the agenda. In addition to the events that we have going on within the auditorium, the breakout <coughs> sessions in the other rooms, we also have flash talks that are happening during the breaks. Yesterday we had quite large audiences, so people seem to have been aware of them. Um, but just in case you're not, uh, at each of the breaks in the downstairs below where we're uh, eating our food, there are flash talks. I believe there are three today, and I encourage you to uh, listen to those once you've grabbed your food. I also want to encourage people, because one of the main purposes of this meeting is to create connections, um, foment collaborations. Uh, you have the opportunity to have dinner with your colleagues. Um, we have uh, a sign-up sign up sheets at the reception table. You can identify whether you want to uh, join one of these group dinners, and together you go with your group after the reception to enjoy that dinner. So with that uh, introduction, very brief, I will turn it over to Heidi to start us off for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleagues on this panel. We're going to be talking about using scientific tools to counter illegal land acquisition from local and indigenous communities. And um, we have three different examples for you today, um, one from Liberia, one from India, and one from Honduras. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my organization, the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide. Um, and my colleague, Mache Lu, is also here. She presented yesterday and talked briefly, but I'm going to give a little more description about our organization. And then um, I'll introduce the panelists, and then we'll have time uh, for some discussion with all of you at the end. So um, just to give you a, a brief sense of what ELA is. So we are a network of public interest environmental lawyers around the world in about 80 different countries. And um, these lawyers, um, two of whom are represent, represented here, um, work on the side of protecting the environment and they work with communities. And um, they're working only in the public interest, so they don't work with corporations or with governments. And as the staff of that, of that for this network, um, we have a, a small organization based in Eugene, Oregon, with three scientists and five lawyers. And we support their work um, and their cases pro bono. And so the lawyers help them with legal analysis and um, pulling in case law from other countries that can support their arguments. On the science side, here's one of our um, annual meeting photos. Um, on the science side, we act, um, we do technical reviews for our partners. So we evaluate environmental impact assessments. We'll be talking a lot about that today um, in the various projects we're going to highlight. And, um, and then we also um, serve as expert witnesses in court. Um, so we go and, and testify on behalf of our colleagues. And, um, and then we sometimes also serve as trainers. So we go and work with our colleagues in country and we um, can teach various uh, skills. We can help um, communities do things like better, more effectively evaluate the EIAs that, they're, that are coming forward, um, different projects that are being proposed in their country. Um, and the last thing we do sometimes, and Meche might agree with me on this, my, um, that one of the most fun things we get to do is actually go out in the field, and sometimes we even get to t think about how we would take data that, that we haven't already had the chance to take or that haven't already been um, samples that haven't already been gathered to figure out what would be useful for, for court. So we can help design um, uh, sampling um, protocols and then help our partners um, figure out exactly what um, kind of relief they can ask for as well. So that's what we do primarily. I want to talk a little bit about the three themes for this panel as we were talking about putting it together. Um, 
we came up with these three ideas. And the first one is really that, um, I think these are themes that actually run through this whole conference. But the first one is that really everyone's expertise is needed when you're reviewing an EIA or thinking about a project coming up. So you have the, the experts who may be coming from a different country or from a specific discipline, um, but then you also have the in-country experts and the local community who bring a really different kind of knowledge. They can help you understand whether or not the maps that you're reviewing are even accurate, um, whether or not the description of an area is appropriate. So really you can't have just one or two people looking at, at environmental impact assessment. You need everyone's expertise and um, it's a different kind of, of expertise, maybe not a PhD behind the name, but just as valuable really even more so often. Um, and this is a theme that was brought up yesterday, um, but one of the, the themes that we've discovered in reviewing environmental impact assessments and trying to use our technical expertise to counter these projects um, that are, are, are detrimental or that look to be um, ill-conceived um, is that really oftentimes what's not in the EIA is, um, is what is of greatest concern. So if the, if the proponents aren't talking about how the water is going to be, um, you know, made more turbid or, uh, or in some cases not drinkable if it's fresh water or um, end up um, polluting the, the local environment and, and then it ends up affecting the seafood that people are harvesting. So if those, if those impacts aren't put into the EIA, those are often the places where we really um, highlight those omissions and try to um, help our partners make those arguments for, for the government if they're reviewing them, for providing comments or in, in court. Um, and then the third theme that I really want to keep in mind for all of our presentations today and for our discussion um, is that really I think I want to use this forum as um, a platform to talk about how we really need better systems for these communities. And um, they're just up against it. All of you who have already done um, the AAAS science on call or have an idea about what it means to go out and work um, in this maybe more applied way with communities understand this. But they, um, they really, really need more resources, more time, more people to get involved. And, um, and off, so one of the things that happens is that proponents will throw in all this jargon, or they'll throw in all these ancillary studies that aren't really related to this, the strongest impacts or the most critical impacts for a project, but it can end up being really overwhelming. So our partners can get, um, you know, an, an EIA that's a thousand pages and maybe only 50 or 70 of those pages are really critical for them to read and understand. Um, but it, they may not know what 70 pages, what those 70 pages are. And instead there's this whole um, other, all these other analyses that, that are not quite as important, but, um, but can be really intimidating. So, um, so let's keep those themes in mind for our discussion and for the presentations. And I'm going to bring up um, my first uh, presenter today, who is Laura Palmese. She's an attorney with, um, who lives down in Honduras. She lives on the island of Ruatan. And she is going to be talking about a really um, uh, urgent issue that's happening um, with a cruise ship development. And it is happening in our next presenter's community, Shireen Grant, who is able to come from the community of Constellation Bight where the development is occurring. So the two of them are going to um, talk together, but I think Lauda, um, who's an attorney, one of our, our ELA attorneys, is going to come speak first. So come up. I'll switch this out somehow. Let's see. Let's escape out of here. You want to play the video first? Yeah. Fully. Uh, okay, so now I'm sort of like driving a bus that's not mine, but um, let's see, where's the, maybe here, and the community message, or the, okay, 
So first we go. Ten Bay Islands is located roughly 35 miles off Honduras coast in the Western Caribbean, with a population of approximately 90,000 people, 50 plus communities, and dozens of villages. Being known for tourism, fishing, and culture, one of the main attractions in the island. One of the most famous communities on Roatan is now Consolation Bay, a community that is known for the fishing area, also one of the most beautiful coral reef barriers areas. But in 2018, in the month of August, life within that community would be changed forever. The corals and sea life would be destroyed drastically. Tons of gravel, cement, filling, rod, and even oil was horribly thrown over the corals, killing millions of species therein. The community and community board filed complaints to human rights to environmentalist offices, also to authorities local and national for support, and sadly, nothing was done. Some of the damages, irreparable damages in this community Communities is that the Turtle Sea is drastically dying. The recreational area for kids and elders is now covered in a moss and dark, dark water. The community of fishes and other animals that would have come to reproduce have nowhere to do this natural act. The elders would use this water as medicine and now it's contaminated. But we will not be silent. Our voices would be heard. No more violence against our environment. We will not silence our voices to the damage to our our beautiful community no to the damage of the coral reef okay. good morning I'm going to try to explain why would someone throw cement and gravel over coral reef. And this is uh, about a case study of a cruise ship port expansion in Roatan. So we have two cruise ship ports in Roatan. We receive over 300 cruise ships a year. But I'm going to focus on the port of Roatan, the one known as Port of Roatan. The other one is Mahogany Bay. And this port of Roatan was uh, originally built by the National Port Company, but in 2004, uh, the municipality and the Institute of Tourism signed uh, an agreement to become a private company. And this private company allows from other, for other investors to come in and other partners to join. And um, ITM Group, a Mexican company, joined uh, last year. And now is now administering the port and doing uh, and taking the lead on the project that is taking place now. So before ITM, uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines was one of the companies that was administering the port, and they did a first expansion in 2007. They had proposed a, a bigger expansion than what they did. This first expansion consisting in filling the ocean to build a parking lot to the east side of the port that you can see there. Now to the west side of the port, there was another proposal to fill and, and build a commercial area. But uh, until last year, this was not built. We really don't know why it wasn't built, because everything, the road was paved for it to be built. Uh, the phase two of the expansion of the port was declared to be in the public interest. And the Ministry of Environment was exempt from uh, complying with the rules for the control of the development of the Bay Islands. These rules prohibited this type of projects because they were very harmful to the area. Also, this area is a um, national protected area. It's a national marine park. So um, with this law in place, uh, all these protections are not more uh, enforceable. So the expansion that the cruise ship port uh, proposed was this major commercial and recreational area to the west side, and um, it was known as the Roatan's Disney World. Um, it, uh, it was uh, to be built in an area that was used by the community, as you saw in the video, uh, the, the sea, and this green area that you see around is actually the community's houses and cemetery. This other picture shows all the all the houses that were around the project. I am sorry for the quality of the maps, but we got these maps from a video that the company presented. We don't have actual maps for the project. 
So uh, last year with this uh, big threat, um, we decided to bring in international experts to sh help us with this. So uh, we brought in Dr. Heidi Weiskel to hold workshops with the community and with the co-managers of the protected area. So now the co-managers are a group of people with environmental background that are often presented with an EIA the night before the inspection or have to review the EIA in a week after the inspection. So uh, Heidi uh, taught us how to um, review it, how, how to look for those gaps, those uh, topics that the proponents fail to address that are most often the most important socioeconomic and technical topics um, and issues that the project has. And then with members of the community um, who have non-environmental background, how to look for arguments that the community can counter with knowledge that they have from their ancestral use of the land. So the community reviewed this EIA along with Dr. Weiskel, and um, they found many inconsistencies. One of the big inconsistencies was that the EIA was very old. It was 12 years old. Uh, no new EIA was presented if the project was going to build in 2018. They held to the one of 2006. Also, the EIA failed to, exp to explain what was the need for the project. So they said more cruise ships were going to come, but why do we need a commercial area built over the reef to have more cruise ships to come? Also, it didn't assess other alternatives. The only alternative was the no project alternative. Um, also, um, because of the damage to the marine life, they proposed as a compensation measure to rescue the corals. This was the word they used, rescue the corals and planting them somewhere else. And as for the fish, they, uh, in the EIA, we had, they said that the fish were going to move somewhere else. So now they're taking the corals and the fish away from the community and that's not seen as an impact, as a negative impact for the community. Um, also, uh, for the noise of the construction, uh, it was to be kept within the areas of the project, apparently, according to the EIA. It will stop at the road and maybe a little bit in the ocean. And the design included in the EIA was different to the one presented uh, last year. Of course, it was a an old design, and they improved it with new features. And the community is still unaware of what is the design of the project. Other inconsistencies, uh, very often the wastewater is not considered in these projects, but we know if more cruise ships are going to come down of the cruise ship, then the more cruise shippers were going to come down of the cruise ship, then more people are going to use the toilet. So um, what, what, where that wastewater was going to go? They proposed another compensation measure to uh, build a pump station and then get connected to the water, wastewater system of the community or the sewage system of the community, which doesn't exist. There is no sewage system in this community. <coughs> and the, the last one, the, uh, there are many more inconsistencies, but the last one is that there was no community involvement in this EIA. The community of Constellation Bite is not even mentioned in the 400 pages of the EIA. And um, there were some surveys at the end of the document that were to be done for the community, but there is no results of this survey, so they were not applied. This is the design that they presented uh, in the EIA, also a very bad map that doesn't really show what's happening, but it, at least we can see that it was way smaller than what they presented uh, afterwards. So the filling started very fast. Uh, the proponents didn't even have the full permits to start to build, but they started and they uh, started to fill the ocean. And the community reacted, as you saw in the video, they filed many complaints to the National Prosecutor's Office, to the Human Rights Office, to the municipality. They were willing to have a dialogue with the board, held several meetings with the staff of the board and even requested a meeting with the governor to talk about this issue because this is a project that is supported publicly by the president. But the, government denied, the governor denied this meeting unless the community uh, ceased in their efforts to impede jobs and economic prosperity for the island. And currently, the community is exploring other options to file a suit. 
um, based on the right to the free prior and informed consent and all the impacts that are not, were not assessed for the project. So this is the current situation. It's, it continues to grow, the feeling, and um, Jereen is going to explain how the community has lived this whole process. The video first or the last? Hello, my name is John Walter. I'm the Vice President of Consolation Bike. I'm here with the Board of Representatives of Consolation. And yeah, we had such a beautiful area at the seaside, which has been drastically damaged for the construction of the Port of Rotan. Our reef has been destroyed, which was a recreational area. And now we are left without help. Yeah, this um, here, the Constellation by community was a fishing community. We is um, a population of approximately seven to five families. So our main activity was at the seaside, and now that has been compromised. Welcome to the destruction of the reef in Constellation Bay. Good morning. My name is Jareen, as Laura mentioned, and I present to you the board of Constellation by, by the way, and they say hi. I think they're watching us actually, that's what we were trying to do a few minutes ago. And this journey, let me tell you, has been a more bitter than sweet journey because we wake up one day in our community and we went sleep, seeing fishes with a beautiful view, and the next morning we wake up, and we're like, we dreaming? So some of us start to pinch each other, and we, so one actually like slapped the other, and he's like, no buddy, you're not dreaming. This is the real deal. And as a community in the Bay Islands that has more than 300 years, it's a, the land of the chosen, we call it, because in that same community, we have the cemetery in the Bay Islands. And the port was actually a donation in order to help the area that the actual port is located was donated in order for it to be used as some type of source for the community. That is where the actual Methodist church was located. But due to the fact that two hurricanes came and took the building away, then that was the reason that they moved from there. And saying that, this generation, the generation that I belong to, by the way, is a generation that asks a lot of questions. Our ancestors, sadly, we would say, they were in a position that they would say practically yes to anything, not absorbing and seeing the consequences that comes after. In our case, in the community, the only proof and support that we had was our ancestral knowledge. We didn't have no scientific proof. We didn't have no one to come in and say, okay, so they're damaging the corals because of this. The only reason we knew is because that was our source of living. We protected the corals because we know that the fish came from there. And this, this was one of the ways that the community lived. We took care of the corals and the reef. These investors, sadly, they mentioned a few weeks ago, oh, we just removed the corals. So what happened to the reef? Did the reef just disappear? So then they were questioning, oh my gosh, these people really know a lot. But it's not that. It's like we have a connection to that area. And it also impacts in a social aspect. We only have one cruise ship in that community, and in case of a chaos catastrophe, it takes more than 20 minutes for you to reach. We only have one road in the Bay Island. It takes more than 20 minutes. Now, sadly, on the video, you all saw, they're closing in our bay, meaning we can't come in through land or sea, violating, again, another one of our human rights. So it's no human rights, no environmental rights, no type of rights. We filed petition to the president of the country to the mayor, the governor, the deputy, and all of them are washing their hands because they call it 
tourism. But in our community, we've done some fights, and we thank La Laura, and then further along, Miss Haiti came, because they were the only two that really supported us out of the box. The governor said, no, I don't want to meet with negative people. So we were like, okay, that makes you a bigger, bigger, minus negative person <laughs> because of his attitude. And you know what I was seeing, seeing some of the presentations from yesterday is that mostly all of the Afro-Indigenous group have something in common. You know, we value our land and we value it very much because that's our source. The only thing we know in the Bay Islands is land and water. Sometimes we put a lot of importance to the sweet water, as we call it, or river water, but the salt water is important also because the kids in the community, the elders and everyone, bathe in the sea. And by all of that filling up that happened, sad to say, the colony of fish that we had within the bay, we had a stingery that was big, black, with white spots on it. We used to call her. We even said it was a her. We didn't even know. We're not scientists. We, we didn't go and inspect. But we assumed that it was a she. So we said, we're going to name her Consolation Bite. Consolation Ray, sorry. And for the last few months, we've not seen Consolation Ray enter, because if she comes in, she has no way to get back out. Also, we called um, the parrot fish, we call it back home, squab. Squab is one of the fish that we would catch with mango. And now even the colony of squabs are not inside of the bay. We asked them, why did you all remove the corals from within our community and put them out there by you all? Oh, because we were trying to protect the corals and Mr. Hudson, he was a scientist, I don't know who he is. He went and he said that the transplant of the corals was 99.11% successful. I said, gosh, I didn't know Jesus Christ came back to earth. But at the same time, it's like the situation that we have in the community is very, it's chaotic. I had the privilege in November to actually swim out to the reef. And my painting, I'm gonna stand in front here, sorry. This is the only picture of my kids, my grandkids, will have concerning the reef. Because there is no more reef in front of our community. So, sorry. This is just one of the many situations that is taking place. And we're so thankful to have this opportunity to be here. Nitaya, I just met her yesterday from True Cost. You do not know the blessing that you have been, along with Laura and Miss Haiti, to make us expose this because in our country, sadly, we all say that every country is democratic. Whether you're Republican, eat a Republican, don't care what Republican you are, we all say that we are a democratic country. And sadly, that is not the case in Honduras. Yes, we are supposed to be a democratic country, but it's not so. These spaces are key for us to really see the situations that are happening, not just in our community, but in communities worldwide where we do not have the platform. In doing this, we also made an Afro-English channel because everything in Honduras is Spanish, even though our mother tongue is English. We started, we created a, a page on Facebook that is called Bay Islands Journey News Unfiltered, trying to expose all of this type of situations. Because the local ones would get paid from the company and shut us down. They even would get paid from authorities and shut us down. So we said we're not gonna stop. And like a, a song that Bob Marlis, we love him dearly, that says, get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. You can fool some people sometime, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And that has been one of our aim in not being silent and not sitting down to all of the injustice that is going on and taking place in our communities. Because yes, we want, we're not against tourism, but if it's gonna affect our environment, affect our social area, then we don't need the stupid cruise ships. Leave them here or leave them there. They were actually gonna build a Disney World in our community.
So we told them, where are you all from? Oh, we're from Mexico. So when you want to go to Disney World, don't you go to Orlando? Do you think that tourists want to come to Rotan to see another Disneyland? They want to come and get in contact with nature. Some of, some of the most powerful medicine doctors we were discussing this morning, Dr. Zebi, they are from that side of Honduras. So why do we need to create a lie? Because it's all a lie. The cemetery that we have, we have ambassadors that have been buried there. They want to come and paint them and remove it and say they're going to use it for parking. So we told them, in Mexico, don't you all celebrate your dead in October or, or September, August, whenever? They said yes. So that means if you're celebrating your dead, come on, respect our dead. If you're not respecting the life, respect the dead. Those are monuments that we have in the community, and they're trying to take away everything. So we are trying one way or the other to fight, fight. My life is practically a threat at this moment. But I've made my mind up that my voice is not going to be silent. I have a legacy to live for my kids. And if I sit and be comfortable, then what example am I giving to them? And what example am, am I going to be leaving for my grandkids? Hopefully, I will get them in due time. But the situation is very sad. You know, I get very emotional every time I talk about it because that has value, you know. All we have lived in that community is corals, the sea life. And now this company comes in. But if I want to build a house, oh, they're going to give me, you have to bring this law, you have to bring the other. But then these people that are destroying the environment, and then we say, we are protecting the environment. What are we protecting? And like I said, if we did not have the opportunity through ELA, you all at this moment wouldn't even know what is taking place in our community. Our community is one of the smallest ones on the island, and our main source was fishing. Do you all think that we can fish in that type of water? Our grandparents, they would use the salt water for medicine for their knees. That is some of our belief. And now it's polluted, and no one is saying nothing about it. So we need you all, and we hope that you all enjoy the presentation and that you all would take some type of interest in these type of things. I did not study. I'm not an environmentalist lawyer. I'm not nothing that has to do with science. But I am a human being, and as human beings, I think that we all have something in common. And what is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. And soon we won't have no water, no air to breathe. Soon we won't have nothing because we are allowing people that say they are investing to just come in and destroy what we've grown up in, what we've lived our whole entire life. And it's very sad. So I want to thank you, Natalia and Laura. And Ms. Haiti, thank you all so much. Bless day. Thank you so much, both of you, for speaking and for coming. It's not um, easy to make these journeys, and you did. And thank you for the power of your words and the integrity of the lives that you're living. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn. It's a little bit of a rough transition, but this is the way things work. I'm going to turn to another. Um, case that we've been working on at ELA. Um, and this is a one that is, this is a case that's taking place in India. Um, and it's one that I've worked on. And we would have loved to have also brought someone from, um, from that community uh, to speak, but that um, he doesn't speak English and it was a farther journey. And so um, we were lucky to have Shireen come <laughs> um, as our community representative. 
So this is a, 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 a brief talk. I'm going to run through this one because I really want to highlight um, the, the people who are on stage who are not me. But um, this was an important case. We're trying to fight a coal fire power plant in Chennai, south of Chennai in India. And um, it's a 4,000 megawatt power plant, which is fairly big, called um, the Chayur Ultra Mega Power Plant Project. And it came up several years ago for, uh, for it was proposed several years ago in this um, village uh, along the coast. And I went to visit to see the area and to meet with our partner, who's um, Shweta um, Navarin, who's on the next to me, and then the two plaintiffs who were bringing a lawsuit against the company um, because of the weak EIA that had been presented. And one of the things that we were concerned about with the EIA is that um, there were there was very uh, inadequate information about the impacts on the community. And one of the um, so we knew that there were going to be toxic fuel emissions. We knew there would be coal dust. If you think about a power plant coming up, one of the things about this area is that there was really nothing there. And so um, no, I shouldn't say nothing there. There was no infrastructure there. There was lots there, um, but no infrastructure. So this is what was there. Um, and what they wanted to put into this area was not just a coal-fired power plant, but also um, a port to receive imported coal. And so that comes a, with a lot of infrastructure as well. You can imagine you need to have a, a, a conveyor belt to bring the coal from the, you need to build a jetty, you need to build uh, uh, a conveyor belt or a railroad or some way to get the coal over to the coal plant, then you need to have the area that's uh, dedicated for the coal um, ash from the power plant itself. So it ends up being this, um, it has this enormous footprint in addition to the emissions that are generated um, and affect nearby communities and, and um, coastal sea life as well with the mercury deposition. So there's a lagoon that's nearby that's very important for uh, migratory seabirds. And um, and so we went to visit this whole area and to um, try to figure out exactly what the impacts were and then really to ground truth what I had read, what we had all read in the environmental impact assessment. And um, one of the really important um, aspects of the EIA was that they had really said, uh, the proponents had said that the beaches weren't being used at all. And they had very good evidence. Apparently, they had gone out in the fields and looked and seen these empty beaches. And so they said, no, there's really no, there's no, not going to be any community impact at all. And so what we found when we went was something substantially different. And so it was satisfying to be able to say, wow, OK, we're really reading an actual lie in this EIA. And it's very easy to disprove, because now I have my own photos that I took where I see people using this area. But then we, um, so my voice could be useful in that regard. And, and expert from another country, and um, I have some letters at the end of my name, and so I can sort of raise the alarm about this. But really what we needed was, um, was someone in the community to also verify um, that this was true. And so um, one of the very cool things that happened was that we sort of, um, Saravanan, who was the person who was in the photo with us, one of the plaintiffs, um, lived in one of the coastal villages that was on these beaches that were going to be affected. And he said, aha, uh -huh. all right, so I am um, I am looking at the maps from this EIA, and I'm recognizing that you're not showing my communities. You're not showing the way that we use this, um, the, the beaches. And we do have a right to customary use of the beaches. And um, so I'm going to learn GIS. OK. And so he did. And he went around to all of the communities along the coast, all of the fishing communities. And they speak different dialects in, a different, in addition to speaking Tamil. And, um, and he interviewed each of them. And then he worked with our partner. Um, and then and, and another researcher, and they produced this paper in an academic journal. So there was, he was very clever and sophisticated about the way that he was using his local knowledge and local connections, and then um, was sort of making this high-level argument. And so what he did was he looked at all the different um, uh, maps, and then he talked about um, sort of you know what was 
um, what should be required, right, by the coastal zone management plan. So there, there was meant to be a housing plan for the communities if they were displaced. There was meant to be, um, you know, sort of like there was meant to be some discussion of how the, the coast was being used, and, and none of that was there. As I said, there was no um, accurate map of the area. The, the maps that were there were in the wrong language, um, and there was no map of the customary use of the ocean resources. So, um, so, what, so the maps that he produced were these, and then he interviewed um, the communities and had them discuss, sort of articulate exactly what, um, what, what they use the beaches for and at what times of year. So I'm, this is impossible to read, probably even, yeah. So I will read to you one of them, the one with the, um, the sort of the hash marking. Um, the description is, um, this is an area used for Pariva Valai, and I apologize, it's terrible Tamil pronunciation. Um, it is a really old tradition in our community. It involves, it's shore seining, essentially. Um, it involves not less than 30 fishermen at a time. It encourages the concept of collective fishing and is one of the main reasons for unity in our community. We use it only during the months of January to March. It is used to catch all kinds of fish. So each of these maps is a seasonal and then um, species description. And, um, and so the idea was to say, not, not only do we exist, but this is the way in which we exist in this area. And so it was very effective, actually. And, um, and then there were a couple of other things that worked in our favor with this project, which has um, still to this day not gone forward, even though it's 2019 and it originally came up in 2013. So one of the changes that happened is that there was all this evidence that, that they had done a very poor job with the EIA, right, as I just went through. And then um, the company, uh, the proponent of the project, um, panicked a little bit about the cost because one of the things that's happening globally is that we know that the cost of, um, it's becoming less and less viable for coal fire power plants to be built. And so they end up being built and then they end up being these stranded assets. So the, uh, the proponent panicked and said, never mind, we're not going to import coal because that would require building this jetty and, um, and, and all this ancillary other infrastructure and it's going to be much more expensive. So we'll get, we'll use domestic coal. Um, unfortunately, India is still producing a fair amount of domestic coal. So, um, with what they, uh, but the problem with that is that your the land that's needed to to control or to hold the the coal ash is almost double because it's so much less efficient. The domestic coal has something like 35 to 45 percent ash, and so it's like it's much much less effect, um, efficient and takes up much more space and it's, um, so even though it was cheaper, it was still not gonna be viable. So the project has been on hold. The other thing that happened is that, um, so our partners recognized that a new EIA really needed to be done and um, the expert appraisal committee agreed with them. So in this case, we're sort of seeing the, the, the system working, although it requires a tremendous amount of vigilance um, on the part of our partners and creative solutions, um, you know, using the, the, the academic, um, angle as well and getting the maps and the local knowledge so everything together is what's keeping this project at bay but um, so so far this the proponents have not produced another EIA and the other thing that's happened is that one of our partners very bravely um, filed a criminal lawsuit um, for fraud against the company and they are not happy about that so they're really they're desperately trying their their um, it's Shweta is the one who filed the lawsuit and she is uh, being very aggressively threatened now because of that. Um, and so, but she has refused to back down. She said, no, I am sure that there's evidence of fraud and as soon as that's discovered, there will be consequences. So she's not settling under pressure. Um, she's a, another one of our tremendously fierce um, advocates in our network. So, so far that we're, we're in good, um, this project hasn't gone forward, which is really amazing. Um, so I am hoping to have saved some time so that I can leave some more time for Alfred Brownell, who many of you heard from yesterday um, as our keynote speaker. And he is another um, force of nature in our network. He's an extraordinary attorney from Liberia, and I'm going to have him come up and give his presentation about what's happening there. Yeah, so you come up. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's give up. And then this is you. So let's see, present.
interview. Yeah. How do you point your stuff? So you can, I, I was using this guy, but that might work too. I'm not sure. There's a pointer left. Like some uh, left. Maybe that's a pointer. Let's see. Does it work? Is it a pointer? I don't know. I don't know if there's a pointer. Yeah. Is there a pointer? No. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. There you go. It works? Push, yeah, push this part right here. Like so you can control the slide with it as well? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Good morning. I will stay in the morning. You're still in the morning. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to be talking about um, um, a, a small portion of part of a project that I was involved with um, that I received some support uh, from um, ELO. As uh, Heidi already said, it, I'm a member of the Environmental Law Alliance worldwide. I'm going to speak slowly. I got some feedback that said I spoke very fast yesterday. So I'm going to take my time to speak slowly. I hope it won't eat up most of the stuff. And so, um, um, so this is concerning um, a, uh, an oil palm operation in Liberia, palm oil, oil palm. Um, so I think I should use this. I'm not the slightest now. Oops. So but, um, first, um, normally when I'm talking, I always want to talk about my country and talk about the history of Liberia, which is right on this first page. Um, you know, I always tell my American friends, you know, do you know Liberia? Like, no, we don't know, you know, where is it located? You know, I'm like, then you have not studied your history because American history is incomplete with all Liberia because Liberia was established by Americans Yesterday, I think I talked a little bit about that. But if you look at this slide, you see exactly why I say so, right? You see the flag. But what is also important is that Liberia is also in uh, West Africa. And this is important because if you look at this ship, you see it that those of us who do done a lot of work around forestry will see what this is. And you see it along this where the green areas are in Africa. And that is very significant for the purpose of this talk today. And this is the reason why. Because many, many years ago, most of West Africa was this. But over time, with mining, cocoa, coffee, agriculture, um, a lot of the regions got fragmented, so it became like this. And the only portion now you see that is very green, still look at it, is where Liberia is. Currently, that fragment of forest, the largest block is in Liberia, about 44% of what we call the Upper Guinea Forest, which is one of the biodiversity hotspots across the world. And so, in uh, 2010, my government started giving out leases, oil, gas, mining, um, and attracting billions of dollars in investment. And oil palm was one of them. You can see what it looks like. And um, the particular company is one called Golden Verulium um, that is based in the south. It's covering five of the regions in Liberia. Um, so there's a term of the agreement for more than 60 plus years um, and covering several regions in Liberia. But this talk is going to focus on just one portion of that region in Grain Crew. And you can see what the amount was for the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the land. And there's an important issue about development, you know, how people view development. And you can see, if you look at the, the concession agreement, you can see what they call the developed area and the undeveloped area. So a place is developed if you have oil palm. When there's no oil palm, it means it's undeveloped. That's back to five 
that this is a highly biodiversity area with all of the species still undeveloped. And you know, this is what happened at the farm. Um, and then so on the basis of uh, proceeding with trying to do this, um, with the lease, um, then they, they had to do an uh, ESI um, that is consistent with Liberian laws. So the company did an environmental impact assessment. You can see the letter. That letter actually came to our office, inviting us to review the EIA. And I'm sure a lot of uh, those who've been involved in this, you know what, what it is. They send you, you know, a three, four hundred page document over the weekend and say, you get it on a Friday evening, you know, when they're about to go home, they come and drop it. Or so now on the Thursday evening. And say, so Monday, we're going to have the hearing. So poor Heidi and Mark from ELA, our lifesaver, like, oh, we have this, you know, we have to call them, and we have to quickly scan it. In fact, I remember this particular year's I, we have to like scan it page by page. So imagine scanning a page, almost like 400 pages. Every page you scan to send it out to them, and they're waiting at the other end to see how it's coming. And don't forget about the other side, you know, the internet, we have very poor connections. So sometimes it takes like, 10, 15 minutes to be able to just scan and download and send one email up. But you know, they did the assessment of the ESIA. And um, so there were a number of issues about the ESIA that was involved in the assessment that uh, was done by the E-Law to try to support us. Um, first is that there's a whole question about community consultation. And I will tell you a phone, and it's always what we've seen. So they go to the community and say, we have to come to the, consult, and they put that in the ESIA. But what is that community consultation? The communities go to the village and say, we've come here. We want to help you. We want to build a school. Do you want a school? Yes. Who wants a school? Put their hands up. And the villagers put their hand up, and then they snap the photo. Oh, we are going to build a highway. Do you want a highway? Yes. Who want a highway? Put your hands up. And they put their hand to snap it. Then they read the ESIA and they put the photos. They said, oh, we have come. So to have come to this meeting, we're going to have some food. So sign your name and people sign. They take their signatures. They take their photos. So people hands up like people have voted for this. But in this ESI, there's another problem because the problem of the population. The census show one figure. And in their own few surveys, they had another figure. And they were confused, not clear in terms of what the population would be like. And then, I think what was worse about this ESIA, is they already consulting the communities. They brought together the chiefs and the elites in the community to consult them. And they felt they had a decision. So the rest of the population was not consulted at all and only talk to the chief and the elites who they had influence over. So it's the problem that we pointed out. The state felt that they had the support. They refused, in fact, based on those comments, to revise and correct the ESIA. Then they had something else in the ESIA. Um, they said that this area was degraded and it was slashed and burned because there was commitment to address the question of biodiversity in the area. They did not want to address that. They said, oh, it's a degraded area, we can put in oil palm. And so they really didn't do that. But when the assessment was done by the E-Law folks and the scientists, Mark and others from E-Law, um, they went and did um, a Google Hive search, you know, thank God for Google Hive. And you can see the differences. They said this was degraded, but if you look at the Google Hive, you can see what this was. I mean, Guess the amount of forestry. You can still see some areas where there is uh, indications of uh, 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 rotational agriculture, but a lot of the area is um, high forestry areas. And so um, we presented that to them, and they refused to try to correct it. And so we used the information that was given to us by the folks from ESIA, plus all the work we did ourselves. And we went to the communities, we assembled them, we organized them, and we educated them about the maps. You can see we, that map I'm involved in that work, trying to educate them. And what we also discovered, in addition to our work, we did some GIS work. We figured that even in the areas where they had these constructions, it had covered the communities. You see, there were towns and villages within the constructions. I don't know whether this is going to work now. Oh. 
So you can see villages in the construction that were being covered by this agreement. So it means that our yeah, communities were benefited as well. So like I said, we pointed out to the, the villages and then the people came to action. You can see here yeah, the locals coming together and demanding that you know, they should leave, shouldn't take that land. But of course, there's a whole big question about land rights in Liberia, right, in terms of who owned the land. If you follow the history, I'll show you the first slides about the SLF coming in. There were folks who had pre-existed uh, the form of Liberia. And of course, um, you know, before then, the indigenous people had already interacted with uh, other European uh, travelers. There's even a map to show that the indigenous were there before the state was established. And even the Constitution of Liberia is very clear. The rights, because the government gave this right to the companies believing they had the authority to give rights to land. But if you look at the Liberian Constitution, the only right the government had was over mineral and not land forestry. So we established that. And I think sometimes it's very important. And yesterday, I, I don't know how much I came across, but sometimes we forget the amount of knowledge you know, that is in those communities. We're talking about science and scientists. Here is a GIS expert. And he was able to really walk us and show us the map of his land, the land use system, and the management. And he's training people to pass this knowledge on. And sometimes when we, when we talk about science, we most times don't forget that we actually have our scientists. They are doing this work. And I had a conversation today on the side, and I, t I told a colleague, I'm like, now all of us are concerned about the impact of fossil fuel on climate change. We talk about deforestation. But who are the people from the very first day have resisted taking the oil from the soil, taking the mineral from the soil, cutting down the trees? Who resisted that? has been indignant people because they know what the impact is. They know that this is a Pandora box. Do not touch this. Now we have realized what fossil fuel can do. The entire planet is burning. Those people didn't have to go to the Harvards. They knew what this would have been and they resisted and organized, but we did not listen to them. So now we know. These are the people who told us about what this is going to be, the maps. And this is what the result is. So they ignore that. They refused to revise the ESIA. The government supported them. And they cleared up the land. They dist I mean, I don't, I'm very emotional when I'm talking about that. And then they said, oh, you know, we're going to give you jobs. This is the job they gave. The women get up 2 a.m. in the morning to go claim on the farm. And of course, you saw the map of the villages, right? So people live within the concessions. And then what do they do? They put in no trespass signs on their own land. You can't move, they stop you. So you can imagine people, land taken from them, they don't have compensation, they have slave-like jobs, and then on their own land they put in no trespasses. And in addition to that, when they pass on the land, they bring criminal charges. So I spend a lot of my time going from village to village, trying to secure bonds, secure releases, fighting criminal charges. And you know, it's interesting, the government, the government will bring charges against poor communities. Oh, this is a um, terrorist threat. Terrorist threat. This is a attempted murder. This is theft of property. You know, this is criminal trespassing. And you go to the village and you will resist the, the, the charges. You're required to file a bond and the government will not go to court. They just use that to wear you down, not to fight. So I spent almost about 75% traveling from village to village, fighting criminal charges. And they try to exhaust you. They won't proceed on something like this. So of course, um, not just uh, the villages, they are dead. You know, my sister talked about you know, the, the, the graveyards. Same thing, my dear. This is it. It's the same thing, so you are talking and uh, tears are coming from my own eyes. So we had to figure out what to do. So we had to organize. So we had options of whether 
Uh, and this is a little bit above what this is about, but I just figure out oh, it's good to let like, you see what the whole realm this is. Whether to go to court in Liberia. So we tested the court system. You know, there's a regional court, try to figure out what that is. And then uh, we have to know where to follow the money. Someone said the easiest way to address it is to go after the money. We realized that the company needed to be certified as a sustainable pump operation. And they are signed up to a, something called a round table on sustainable palm oil. And the round table on sustainable palm oil have what they call a non judicial grievance mechanism that you can bring a complaint to address what's going on. How's my time going? Mm, we're close. Close. Oh, wow, fast. So we filed a complaint against the round table on sustainable palm oil. And we got them to verify the complaint and issue a stop order against the company. You know, and the complaint, I mean, we talked about, wow, you saw the impact already. I don't have to go over that. And the round table is based on these principles. There's principle one, that they behave ethically. Principle two, to respect the laws of the country, free, prior, informed consent. Principle seven is to protect, conserve, and enhance ecosystem. So we follow those. And our research shows that the company was not following those as well. And this information came from the analysis of the ESIA that the Environmental Law Alliance gave to us. So we used that ESIA, we did our field research, we did a mapping, and we brought a complaint against the company. And so, like I said, they stopped them. And then the government, all this time, 2010, 2011, 2012, we did not battle to respond to its own citizens. We organized protests, marches in the villages, met the local authorities, met the parliamentarians. We brought hundreds of communities to the city. They went to the parliament. They met all the ministers. Everyone kept quiet. When we filed a complaint, and then the round table issued a stop order then the government got into action. In fact, I always laugh, we're in the meeting, I've never seen government officials protesting. So they said that, um, in fact, the president said, by filing this complaint against these companies, our action was seditious and were undermining the sovereignty of the state. And they did not want the company to sit down and negotiate with the communities. And they asked us to withdraw the complaint and the locals refused. So we're at a meeting in the village trying to meet the company. And the ministers, about five of them, came and tried to stop that. And, and the company said, we're going to have the meeting. We're in a uh, room. And the minister started banging on the door, insisting that we should not hold these meetings with these uh, top communist executives. It was very interesting, because I have not seen government officials actually protesting. But this is what the power is when you connect science to this sort of work. You can actually change the power dynamics. This is what happened in the villages. And the president had to go up to the villages. Finally, she had to get up to go. So she went, I'm sorry, you know, we made a mistake. We made some error. We didn't consult you. So yeah, it's Madam President talking to the villagers. But you know why? You have to dismiss that lawyer. You know, he's causing problems. He's trying to stop the investment for coming in. I need to create a job and build the infrastructure. She's not saying that we are destroying the largest forests in West Africa, the largest carbon sink, the home from indigenous people, their grave, their life load. No, no, no. It's like I'm bringing business investment, and he's not good for the country. So I became the problem. And I was even invited in that meeting, you know. She's like, you! Alfred Brunel, I'm not going to allow you to do this. I will lock you up. True. I will charge you with sedition and economic sabotage. I will revoke your lessons to practice law, and you will not get a bill. Madam President, guess what I said? I'm just a messenger. <laughs> and so they refused to agree to the president's plea. And they head on, and there was some protests. And of course, the police, as usual, you see them arresting, raped for the entire villages. And of course, that's why I'm here. I got attacked myself. I was supposed to flee the country. But 
even here, I had my, I regained my voice. I continued the case, and we won the case against them. We stopped the company, and they took an appeal. They lost the appeal, and they wanted to remove themselves from the system. We challenged them, so they, they are back. We continue on with them. But what I want to speak lastly about is what the implication is, because we're talking about an oil palm, a small company in Liberia doing this. What the implication is, we know deforestation has implications for greenhouse gas emission. The first I'll show you is being cleared away. It causes climate change, we see what it is. It causes conflicts, we see what it is. It allows people to move, and migration is the implication. We see what it is, and it starts internally. We're like, oh, there's conflict going on in Liberia, and in Nigeria, and in Guatemala, and in El Salvador, in Ecuador. But we don't have an idea of what is beneath the veneer of these things going forward until we start seeing this. Then we ask the questions, why are they coming? Why are they, uh, yesterday I said that, why are they at the border? And I always say, we see the river but we don't see the tributaries. And what is behind these things is our own desire. We walk to these grocery stores. I'm sure we are here this week having food. We don't have an idea what is driving this. The demand. You know, when you walk in a supermarket, you probably say, oh, I'm going to buy craft. And you think it's one product, but you look at it, one company owns about 10,000 different brands. So the company itself owned by the person influenced that. This is what drives this process here. You can see in the case of Nestle. So this is it. So we have to find a way to address these issues and there are implications around that. Thank you. I know, I know we started a little bit late, but I also don't want to um, have us keep being late. And I don't know if we have just someone, maybe Teresa, how do we feel about just talking for a little bit, like five minutes of discussion? Okay. So what I might do in that case is, um, is just open it up for you guys. I had some questions prepared for my panelists, but, um, but I think it might be more interesting for all of us to, to talk. So I'm just going to put the slide back with um, the three themes, but if people have questions, they can start asking them of anybody. I wonder how you Do you want to go to the mic? Yeah. I wonder how you found ELAW. <laughs> that is an interesting story because within the most communities in the Bay Islands, we are people that are not trustworthy. So when we saw Laura, we're like, who is she? Where did she came from? What does she want? Did the company send her? So it was something miraculous, we would say, that Laura actually came into the community and she started feeding around, and we started like setting her up, and she didn't even know we were setting her up. I'm sorry, I'm telling you right now. And then we started to see, you know what? She's actually genuine, and we feel like we can work with her, and why not? We have tried everything else. I don't leave without this. Notes to the president, notes to everyone else, so why not give it a shot? with her, she might just be the light to the end of the tunnel that can help us get out of this. So that's how we actually get in contact with her. She came to us. We didn't even know she existed. We didn't even know anything about ELA, nothing. So it was Laura that actually came in with us. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, during your presentation and, and also yours as well, I was reminded of uh, the quote from the American conservationist from the early 20th century, John Muir, that uh, nothing dollarable is safe. And um, I'm wondering, in light of that, how can scientists uh, be more effective at helping you make the case that, that development in this way is actually a bad business decision, in, that, 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 you know, the incentives uh, 
for short-term versus long-term, sustainable profits are actually better if, if development takes place in a way that does not have these impacts. Okay, that was one of the situations that we had because it was kind of our word against their word, and we didn't have the professional support of a scientist to come and say, hey, actually, you all know that if by removing this, you're violating this law, you're violating the next thing. We were just like, if you move these corals, you're taking away our means of source of life, etc." So it's scientists that can work faster within our communities and that are available and have the resources to do so, I think that can be very effective for effective, sorry, for us within the communities. Because in the case of Laura, she is on, on the island. But in the case that we didn't have her on the island, like a scientist in the capital of Honduras would be of no benefit to us because she or he is all the way over there. But if we have scientists located in all of these communities, like I stated, in most of the Afro and indigenous communities is where these type of damages are occurring. So if we have scientists that have resources and uh, a red, a red like we call it, uh, a group of other scientists that can move a little bit faster and quicker, then we can be able to find out if this development, in fact, is viable. It, it will bring benefit to us, and not in this case that in this case that it was a threat and a damage to us. Alfred, I don't know if you want to try to answer that question as well. Or... Oh. Sure. Um, you know, um, is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I read thing, you know, has had a hard time yesterday to talk to it no more. This is my first time speaking to a group of scientists. It's a little bit different. You know, people are like very calm, unemotional. It's difficult to see, but, you know, there's a lot of processing going on for scientists. I find it very peculiar, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think what we've done in the, in the field of law is what I think scientists have to start thinking about. Because you know, like I said yesterday, you have the numbers, you've seen the trends, you've done the analysis, you have the data. You know more where this is going because you're playing with that. And so if science, like I said in my statement yesterday, if the, the incentive for science, if the only incentive for innovation, for technology, and for science is profit, then there's a problem. So I think scientists have to start thinking about having an arrangement to say scientists in the public interest to really advance public interest work, like we've done in the law. So have public interest lawyers. You know, before it was law was like that whole conservative field and everything, but a lot of public interest lawyers now, like, you know, others who are just like me. I left from the U.S., I went back, and I take my backpack, and I move from towns and villages and do community lawyering. You know, I'm one place sitting in my office, but I have paralegals in like six, seven different courts. I'm on my phone. I'm talking to them. They are before a judge and they are pursuing the cases and they are ensuring the end of justice. Science has to get to that level to be in the public interest. That also includes economists. You have to be econ economists in the public interest. We've got to have new models of economics, new models of investment and development. We're seeing that. And that means scientists have to spend a lot more time with like who I show you. That villager who has done his GIS, his land use management, who understand what it is. Because these people have developed a system of entrepreneurship and governance science that I feel we are not spending time to see it. So we have to change to so go in, work with indigenous people, and see what is it done. Because they know better. They live with nature. They understand. There's no what's going to happen. They were the ones who were raising the alarm hundreds of years ago that we should not do what we have done. We sat down and we conceptualized poor communities and indigenous people. First, that they are small people, that they have small civilization, that they have small gods, and that we must babysit them, that they were poor and miserable, and because of our education, we are going to rescue them. It's a different thing altogether. We have to find a way to listen a lot more, to talk to them a lot more, and figure out how we can find a balance. And I believe this is where science needs to go. And to get all of the laboratories, 
get out of the university, get out of, out of the research and bury in the books and get in the field and talk to people who are seeing things in real time. I think in other ways, science can influence it. And also building linkages, like what we see here with this network and more scientists volunteering to be on call. I think that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, we're going to end it there. So thanks to all of you so much for coming.